Thank you everyone for joining Students Keeping Students in School, um, Restorative Peer Courts. Um, last time we had this webinar, um, we did not record it, and so Karen has been so lovely to record this again and provide all of her really great information again. And I will be asking the questions that were asked at the last webinar, so if you have any questions about anything, you can of course email me or email Karen. Um, just for everyone's information, of course, um, this webinar is part of the How We Can Fix School Discipline webinar series, um, and the webinars are part of the Fix School Discipline project, um, which you can access all of our data and our information and our tools and everything at fixschooldiscipline.org. Um, the toolkits, which have all of these ready-to-use tools for advocacy and for implementation of different pro um, different preventative and interventionary practices used in schools um, for educators and community members are available there. You can download them from there, or you can also email me um, to um, order uh, hard copies. Um, of course, all of our, our products and, and tools and technical assistance and all of that are 100% free, so just go ahead and email us and um, and let us know if we can help you with anything or get any tools to you. Um, finally, I just wanted, before we get into everything with Karen, um, I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that you can follow us on fixschooldiscipline.org um, and, and join our listserv so you can get all of the information about upcoming webinars or events or anything like that. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, so where we post you know, news or latest research that's come out about um, keeping students in school. And without further ado, I will now change over to Karen, um, change the screen over to Karen, and she will give us a presentation about peer courts that are working in Davidson, at Davidson Middle School in Marin County. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening in to this uh, presentation about peer court suspension diversion. First of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Karen Yunker, and I teach two periods of sixth grade math at Davidson Middle School. And with the rest of my time, I'm responsible for coordinating our school culture and climate programs, one of which is, in fact, the peer court suspension diversion. I'll tell you a little bit about the school where I work. We are in San Rafael, California. That is north of San Francisco, and um, we have produced some amazing results under some fairly trying circumstances. We are a very large middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. We have over 1,100 students this year, and we have about 63% of our students are on free or reduced meals, and about that same number are English language learners, and um, yeah, so that's what I want to tell you about that. We've produced some amazing results in the last five or six years. Um, when we first started, we had about 880 students at Davidson Middle School, and we had 375 suspensions. We were in a heap of trouble, lots of kids getting suspended, lots of disciplinary actions at Davidson Middle School, parents taking their kids out of the school because there was just a lot of trouble. And then we got a fantastic new principal who decided that that was going to be the end of that and that we would experiment with uh, suspension diversion. And so last year we had over 1,000 students and we had fewer than 40 suspensions and we had no repeat offenders as far as suspension went. And that is really amazing and due mostly to uh, the program that I'm about to talk to you about. So I just want to be clear that I'm giving you just the bones of this project. Um, it will require the exact right people and personalities to do the work. It will require uh, figuring out some of your own documents and things like that. So I just want to be clear this presentation is in no way a training. It's simply an overview. And at the end of, the, at the end of my little talk here, I'll be glad to give you my email address so we can talk about any of your particular needs that you'll uh, face at your own school. So let's get started. First of all, what happens with suspension diversion is that by law, assistant principals and principals have some discretion about what is suspendable and what can be offered as a diversion. There are some things that are required for suspension. They must be, students who perform these acts must be 
suspended. And then sometimes there's some wiggle room where the, the administration gets an opportunity to offer the student a chance to divert their suspension if they'd like to. This is part of what works is that students choose the program. Students and their families choose the program. If a student w chooses to be suspended, then they get suspended. So there's nobody comes to the peer court process who's not there by their own choice. We don't have any students who are forced to go through this process. Some schools do it that way. We don't do it that way. And I think that's actually what works is the fact that students and families are choosing to use this process. So there are stu there are two. Um, communities involved in the peer court process. One is the student community. You'll see later on as I talk that the panel, the student peer court, is made up of students. And then the school, whole school community is involved in that we resource anything that we can that's appropriate to the student who's going through the peer court process. And again, I'll talk about all this as we go along. So there are a number of important parts to the peer court process. One are the questions. And later on, I'll tell you what specific questions we use here at Davidson. Another important component is the, are the deliberations, where the student panel, after hearing the answers to the questions that the diverting student gives, they meet together without adults, and they put together a program for the suspending student to attempt to complete. <laughs> if the student completes the program, their suspension gets diverted. They're a very important part are during the deliberation, the student, the parent, and admin, and any other community members are out in the hall during the deliberations. Some amazing conversations happen out in the hall. Sometimes truths get revealed. Um, often parents hear things about their child they didn't know during the question and answer period. Often students hear things about their parents they didn't know. And there's, sometimes there's a breakthrough in love and affinity in the hall and really like the family coming together. So it's very important that we tend to those, those conversations in the hall. Then there's the program that the peer court assigns to the student. Um, the programs are specifically tailored to the student themselves and to whatever their offense was. So for example, if a student is, uh, let's say a student punched another student, they would not be picking up trash on campus as part of their program. Uh, we would have things that are related directly to their offense. So if a student vandalized, let's say vandalized the lockers or something like that, then they might work with the custodian to do some cleanup work. But we don't do, um, we don't do cookie cutter programs. They're, all the program is tailored to the student and to their offense. And then um, afterwards, everyone comes back into the room and there's a debrief where we ask the parents if the program will work and we talk to the student about the program and make sure they're clear, make sure they're actually going to choose to do the program. Then they're sent off. They have two weeks to do the program with uh, coaches support. And so that's important that you have someone on your campus who's going to be available and willing and whose accountability it is to meet with these students at least twice a week to make sure that they're following through in their program, give them any support of, any sort of support that they need to get their program complete. And like that, that's the little gap there. And then we have follow-up. So that's part of what the coach does. As soon as it looks like the student's not completing the program, we take other actions. And then there's completion. If the program is completed, then the student gets the suspension taken off of their disciplinary record and put into their counseling record. Because basically what we're doing is counseling and offering support and having the student help repair the harm that they've done, restore the relationships that they've broken, and reintegrate themselves back into the school community. So that's just a huge general overview. That's like the 30,000 feet look. And now we'll go and we'll look at each of these little bits by themselves and in more detail. So here we go. Right. Thank you for saying that, because otherwise I feel like I'm talking only to myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we go. There's a lot of work that needs to be done before the court meets, and uh, peer court preparation. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, one, we have to choose applicants to be on the student panel. These applicants need to be chosen and vetted very carefully. Here at Davidson, I solicit input from teachers about who they think would be good on the peer court. And I asked them that those nominations would represent the demographics here at Davidson. When I first asked teachers to do this, we got all the students and all the students from student council and all the, you know, all the well-behaved students. And that is great. 
but it's not going to meet the needs of the students who are being suspended. They need to see themselves sitting across from them at the panel. So we choose our applicants very carefully. They must represent the demographics of the school. They must be a good mix of B and C students with a couple of A students on there and like that. And they have to have the kind of personality that where they're going to be willing to speak up and take risks. So we have applications that we do, we have interviews that we do, and we have parents sign an agreement about their support towards the student panel as the year goes on. We have an information session with the students that have been invited to apply, so they get really clear about what they're signing up for, what the hours are, what they need to do, that uh, they, they agree to a code of conduct, so they agree to keep their grades up, they agree to follow the rules, they agree to intervene if it's safe to do so when they see someone being bullied or someone being mean, they agree to intervene when it's safe to do so when they see a conflict. So they make an agreement about all that, and then if they want to, they fill out an application, and we have interviews. So choosing okay. very carefully, having the students be really clear about what they're signing up for, and really clear about their agreements regarding the code of conduct. And I um, am wondering um, if you can talk more about how, you know, just why it wasn't working so well when just A students and, like, the, you know, best students were represented, sure. um, were chosen, and, you know, why sure. that didn't work that way. Yeah. So we first, when we first started experimenting, we actually went through and looked. We had so many suspended students. We went through and looked at those students to see which of the students who had previously been suspended might be good to have on the panel. So we started off like that, and that was just too. It was just it was just not diverse enough of a group. Right. So then yeah. I solicited teachers for students, and just because of our natural biases and all that. They just sent me all the A students, the student council kids. And then that didn't really work because that wasn't a very diverse group either. So kids who are getting in trouble, part of the point of peer court is that kids who are getting in trouble, whose grades aren't very good, who are only sort of loosely connected with the school community, we want them to look across and see a panel of six or eight students, some of whom are like them, some of whom right get C's also. Some of them have been in trouble before. Some of them have been through suspension diversion before. So it's not just a bunch of kids who get A's and have a bunch of family support sitting across from a kid who's in yeah. trouble. We want them, we want the demographics of the school to be represented, first of all, because it's a community issue and a community solve. So that's part of the reason okay. why we do that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Cool. So when everybody's chosen, then we have training and coaching for the student panel. At Davidson currently, I think we have about 20 7th and 8th graders who are trained to sit on panels of 6 or 8. Um, the training involves talking about what are restorative practices, what are the importance of restorative practices, what uh, value do restorative practices have. Part of the training, a huge part of the training is about confidentiality. We practice confidentiality every time there's a peer court. We have this particular exercise that we do. It teaches kids how to just say, I'm not going to tell you. I have a promise not to tell you. You know, because they go back to classrooms and students ask them, who was the peer court for? What was it about? And so we talk about getting to say, I'm not going to tell you, and what a valuable skill that is in their families, in life, in every way. So we practice that all the time. That's a really big thing in the training and coaching. Right. So the kids get trained. They understand what the questions are and the value of each of the questions and like that. So that's all before an incident. So then let's suppose a kid does something. It's an offendable suspense. Then we choose a panel. I choose a panel very carefully and on very on purpose. So I'll look up the rosters for all the the classes of the offending student, and I'll take the kids who are in their classes and put them on the panel. It's always good. Um, if I know kids are friends with other ones, I will put them on the panel. But more often than not, even if no panel members are in any of the classes of the offending student, Justice with a capital J will choose the panel, and there will be their mom's best friend's daughter on the panel, or, oh, that kid was my neighbor. Or, oh, we sit next to each other um, on the bus. So it's amazing how justice prevails in choosing the panel. But I do all that I can to make sure it's going to be a great panel, and then I just trust the process. So we okay. choose a panel, six or eight students, 
and then I voir dire the panel to minimize their bias. So I ask them, I show them a picture. Do you know this student? How do you know this student? You know, has this, how, how would you rate your relationship with the student? So some kids will take themselves off the panel because they're really close friends with the student, the offending student. Sometimes kids will take themselves off the panel because they are really offended by that student or that student was mean or stole something from them. They have a bias against that student. So we check for bias in kids who cannot be firm and fair. And you know what? They're great at telling the truth on themselves. And the promise is, you know, you can take yourself off as many panels as you want to. It does not jeopardize your standing on the court. But our goal is to minimize bias. And they understand that. That's part of the training and part of the coaching is it's okay to say I can't be fair with that person and it's good to actually say that. And then the last part on this uh, preparation is we serve the family and the advocates. We realized early on that families and family members are required, family members or advocates are required to be at each peer court. We do not have a peer court without someone who's a stand for the child or who's intimately involved with the child being at the court. And we found out early on that parents and family members and advocates can show up really upset. They're concerned. What? A bunch of kids are going to judge, judge my child, and they come to defend their child. So we tell them in advance. When we make the appointment, we tell them. We tell them in the waiting room before we go into the court that this is all designed to help their student, to help their child, to help them bring their grades up, to help them develop healthy relationships with their community, to help them repair the harm that they've done, and hopefully to give them a little foothold, a little muscle for doing the right thing and choosing well. So we let the family know, we let the advocates know at the very start, before they come in the room, that this is all designed to help them. There's nothing to defend against. And what they'll find is there's actually a warm, respectful environment of a bunch of kids willing to help their child. So you've got to really make sure that you um, give a lot of great customer service to the family and to the advocates. Because other and, and another thing that we do is we ask them not to speak unless they're asked a question. Because otherwise, parents don't understand. They're there to defend. And they'll just jump in and dominate the whole thing. So we got I get their agreement. Will you agree to not speak unless you're asked a question? And they almost always will say yes. Okay. When they don't, right. then I actually just <laughs> tell them that they can't. They, then they can't come in. We'll have to find someone else. And then they agree. OK, great. Were you going to ask something? Um, I think I was going to ask if parents are included in the um, choice of suspension diversion. So they're kind of introduced to it early, like, oh, what the su suspension diversion program yeah. looks yeah. like. So Yeah, so what will happen is the admin will ask the student, they'll give them the option, and then the parent gets called and told, uh, your child has chosen this option. And the option gets described to the parent, and then we just say, when can you come in? Okay, great. Yeah, so it's really the ch the student choosing. But the parents always go along with it because it's a good deal. Yeah. All right, off we go. Now, he, this is a little bit more about all those components that I just talked to you about right here. So let's look at application and training. So I said some of this before. We want alternative leaders, not the student council necessarily, although a couple of those kids are okay. There's a very rigorous application. There's, you have to get two teacher recommendations. They have to write statements about themselves. They have to sign pledges, all this kind of thing. And they have to agree to the code of conduct. And the parent has to agree that they're going to support the child in all of this. Then we train in the restorative justice basics. We do some mock-ups. It's basically an on-the-job training gig. And then again, confidentiality, confidentiality, confidentiality. We practice that every single time we meet and at every single court we do a little exercise on confidentiality. So and that, is, is there a training manual for panel members, too? Uh, there is not a training manual. No. OK. OK. Yeah, yeah I was just wondering. No, nope, there's just a code of conduct and like that. OK. So that's that. And then we, so now I'm going to talk about who's present in the room and what materials are needed. So first, who is present in the room? There's a panel of six or eight students. There's the offending student, their family members and advocates, some community members who may have been impacted by their actions, so maybe a teacher that they cussed out or the custodian who now has to deal with the mess that they made, um, things like that. There is an administrator and there's a coach. That would be me 
or you, as the case may be. The coach is there to jump in occasionally when the panel, you know, doesn't know what to ask or things get things get tense, which they sometimes do. Um, sometimes kids will skip over things just a little bit, so the coach will jump in and train them basically how to how to answer how to ask the harder questions. And then there's always a translator if necessary. And here are the materials that are needed. You need a headshot of the offending student, the write-up about the incident or action that they did that got them sitting in that chair, the restorative questions. You'll have a list of their grades, their current grades. And you'll have a list of emotions. Because what we noticed is that when students ask other students, so how do you feel about what happened, they'll say bad, mad, sad. And that was pretty much the end of their emotional vocabulary. And then when they ask, well, how do you think your mom feels about this? They pretty much have that same list. So we have a list. We have actually two lists now of uh, emoticons, basically. We have like a choice of 64 different emotions that a child can choose from. So when they get stuck or stopped about that, the panel will say, well, look, there's a menu right there. Why don't you pick two or three of those emotions that express how you feel? And we get much more interesting answers like, I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I feel embarrassed. You know, my mom, she probably feels disappointed and sad. So we get a much more fruitful uh, conversation when we realize that students don't know emotional vocabulary very much. So we just show them and teach them that by giving them a list. There have to be pens because the panel will be taking notes the entire time. And then a very important material to have present is tissue. Because I would say at 85% of peer courts, somebody is going to be crying. The student will often cry. The parents often cry. Sometimes the panel will cry. So it's very important and it's part of customer service is to make sure that there's tissue there. One thing I want to say about tissue, though, is that we don't hand tissue to people because that tends to interrupt their emotion. So we just have tissue available so they can take it if they want to send it a tissue. If somebody wants to wipe their nose on their sleeve or not use a tissue, they get to do that. So that's all there by choice. And that's just a good life skill don't hand people tissues. <laughs> Great, so that's who's present and that's what materials are needed. So where are we next? Now, very exciting, we're going to choose a panel. So I'm going to show you some, I'm going to talk to you about a specific peer court that we did and uh, I'll talk to you about why we chose this panel. So we did a peer court for Pedro. Pedro is a Hispanic boy, eighth grader, and he was caught smoking pot on campus. So he, um, I believe he was suspended for a couple of days. And then um, upon his return, this is the court that we had for him. So we chose the panel very carefully. So they're either in classes with the offending student where we can. They represent the school demographics. We use older students for sensitive issues, sexual harassment, things like that. It's very important to choose students that you think can deal with the issue and then also remain confidentiality. confidentiality. Uh, we choose a panel according to personality. So for some kids, it's important to choose a panel that's more soft-spoken. For other kids, it's important to choose kids where you know there's some on there who are just going to bust their chops. So it's really important to choose carefully. You will choose according to their skills as a panel member. And you want to balance. Um, what we do for trainees at, at Davidson is we have a little gallery. So I'll leave some space for some. So now we're going to start to train sixth graders in the second half of the year. So there will be a gallery where the kids who are being trained will sit and watch and, and like that. And usually, like I said before, Justice, with a capital J, will match the panel with the students. So that's really great. So for Pedro's uh, peer court this year, we chose Brian, Marcus, Victoria, Wilbert, Brian, um, sorry, Bailey, and Lolly. Now look, aren't they gorgeous, first of all? They're beautiful. And you can see they represent the demographics of our school. Right? There's a balance of boys and girls. Um, you know, Brian's a very soft-spoken boy. Wilbert, on the other hand, was completely willing to say to people, ask really hard and embarrassing questions. So this was just a great panel. These are some of our superstars here, actually. So there, so you choose the panel very carefully. What's next? Awesome. Then, go ahead. Oh, no. Um, so I have one question about whether if there's ever um, offenses that are kind of that involve other people. So maybe something happens, like you harm another person 
or, um, you know, some uh, one student is kind of harassing another student. Is there ever a situation where that person who's received the harm or been harmed by the actions of another student, is that person ever at the panel or is that dealt with in kind of a different way? Well, first of all, being on the panel, you, I, I think... Or so at being on the, the panel, sorry, at the suspension right. diversion, so not had, on the panel. Right, so we had a suspension diversion a couple of weeks ago that was sexual harassment, and it turns out that one of the girls that I was going to have a panel with a girl who had been sexually harassed. It was just by sheer luck that someone told me, so she was not on the panel. Only one time have we had someone who was the target be in the room, not as a panel member, but he came to be in the room because he felt, he himself, the target felt it would empower him to actually be present to hear what was going on with the other oh, person. Okay. And by target, you mean the, but, the student who had, had was receiving the harassment? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But that was the one and only time in the many years we've been doing this that we had that happen. Okay, and so usually the other student does not is not right. brought in. Okay, right. The other student's not brought in. Their family's not brought in. None of that. Okay, and and is there any sort of other um, time for that person who harmed another person to to kind of give an apology, or are you going to get yeah. to that? Am I jumping? So that gun? would that would be part. No, that would be fine. That's that that turns out to usually to be part of their uh, two week program is that they'll participate oh, okay. in a restorative circle okay. with the people that they offended. Of course, of course, that makes a little sense. while, but yeah, that's where it gets taken care of. So that's great. Okay, so now we've wadir the offending student. We I introduce the student to the panel, and we brainstorm some of the issues that might come up. So we determine if there's any bias. Make sure everybody can be fair. Do they know the student? So we anticipate issues and concerns. Um, so for example, we had a boy who. Say he was uh, he's on the spectrum, and he had a very quirky way of communicating. So first of all, almost everybody on the panel knew him, but we talked about what it was going to be like to listen to him speak, and how were we going to just constantly, consistently bring compassion and patience to his speaking and to our listening. So we anticipate issues and concerns, and we strategize those things. And what, we, what I mean also by strategize is we have a list of questions. It's sort of a, it's not really a script, but it's an orderly menu of questions. Um, and we strategize who's going to ask which of the questions. Who would be comfortable, for example, introducing the student and saying to them, we understand that you're here for smoking dope on campus. Who'd be willing to do that? And we talk about, we plan, okay, what could you say to Pedro at the start of this? Great. And then we strategize, okay, who's going to ask the mom how she's been affected by what happened? We figure out who, who would like to do that. So we do a little strategizing by just kind of dividing up the, the menu of questions. Okay. So that's before, that's just the coach and the panel are in the room at this time. Okay. And there, so here's a little picture of me, and we're looking at the picture of the student, and we're brainstorming issues, and we're strategizing. And you can see each student has the list of questions. They have a pen. They're ready to go. And it's fine. Sometimes the student, the panel, none of them will know the student. It's fine. It all turns out just great. Okay. Now, this is also very important. I sort of alluded to it before. It's really important to provide customer service for the family and the advocates. We need to explain to them that we're supporting their child academically, socially, emotionally, and that we're going to repair, help them repair, harm, and restore their relationship with the school community. It's really important that parents and advocates show up knowing that in advance. Otherwise, there's just trouble and drama and defense. No. So we can tell them what to expect. We request they don't speak unless they're asked a question. Only one time did a father decline that, so I asked him to... Uh, please then not participate, and he changed his mind. So that was really good. And then once he saw what was going on in the room, he had no, even asked him later on, sir, is there anything that you'd like to say? And he was like, no, I'm fine. Because he had this whole speech made about some other thing that was going to happen, not this compassionate, firm, loving environment that, that our students are on these panels. So it's really important to tend to the parents. Okay, so... 
we already talked about this, so now we're going to actually get into the process of it. The, de the questions, the deliberations, the program, all that. So now we're going to go step by step, a little bit more detail about all of this. So off we go. First of all, the student panel. So we go into the room. Actually, they're already sitting there. We've voir dire them. The parent comes in. Parents come in. Advocates come in. The offending students come in. The panel introduces themselves to the parent or advocate. If the parent or advocate is Spanish speaking, the students speak in Spanish to them. Hello, my name is Wilbert. I'm in eighth grade. That's as simple as the introduction is. And one of them, who's been chosen during the strategy session, gives a quick explanation of the purpose. We're here to support your child, to help them bring their grades up if they need to, to help them repair any harm that they've done, and really to make school a place where they're more connected and more successful. Great. And then the student panel asks questions to the offending student. They listen carefully, and they take lots of notes. So here we are. There is my fabulous panel. Then at the end, after all the questions are over, they deliberate and put a program together. They read the program. They solicit, solicit any questions, and they check for workability. So they might turn to the mom and say, you know, is it OK if they go to football practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2.30? Will that work for you? Or is it OK if they stay after school? How will they get home? So all that gets worked out with the parent right there. They discuss with the student the importance of diverting the suspension. They'll say things like, brother, you do not want to have sexual harassment on your record. It just doesn't look good on you. It doesn't look good on your family. And you know, it's just not a cool thing to have on there. Let's do Let's get this thing handled. And then at the end, they ask the student, do you intend to complete this program? And they get a verbal, a verbal agreement. Right? We don't contract them. They just agree verbally in front of everyone. Okay. Here we are. So all of this is about peer pressure. Peer pressure is really great used for positive purposes. And this is all how it works right. with the student panel and with the offending student. Okay. So there they are. They're listening. They're asking questions. Terrific. Ready? Yes. Here we go. So here are the questions. These questions are not new. These questions are actually from the International Institute for Restorative Practices. They are classic restorative practice questions. What happened? What were you thinking? What have you thought about since? Who's been affected? How have you been affected? If you had a second chance, what would you do differently? And what do you think needs to happen to make things right? So what happened? What did you do or say? That's basically what that's about. And then who's been affected? So what will happen is this panel will ask a student, who's, who do you think has been affected? And they'll say, the person they offended. And then they'll say, themselves. And a lot of times they'll say, no one else has been affected. So the panel will say, how about your mom or dad? Do you think they've been affected? Oh, yeah, probably. Well, how do you think they've been affected? And then they'll often ask the student, to, why don't you ask your mom or dad how they've been affected? And that's really where a lot of the tears and a lot of the breakthrough happens. When the student, a lot of them are like, er, they're hard and they're mad or they're however they are. But when they have to turn, excuse me, when they have to turn and look, right at their parent, a lot of times they can't do it. We have sat in silence for minutes at a time waiting for some tough guy to lift up his head and look at his mother. Okay. And that's okay because part of what happens is the shame response like that shows the student actually knows something's wrong. They know they did something bad. And that's a good thing that they know that. Right? So we spend a lot of time on who's been affected, what did you just hear your mom say? How do you feel hearing her say that? Things like that. So those are the basic restorative questions. But then we ask questions about the student in particular. How are your grades? And they'll say, oh, my grades are good. Yeah, what does that mean? Oh, I get Bs. Well, look, you have a list of your grades right there. Why don't you read them to us? So the student reads their grades. What are your responsibilities after school? Are you in a program? Are you on a team? Do you have chores at home? And they'll ask, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do for fun? And then is there anything else you'd like us to know? And these questions, the whole set from top to bottom, really give the panel a great idea about what's going on with that student. These are not the only questions that get asked. These are the ones that always get asked, but there are lots and lots of other questions that get asked along the way, as you can well imagine, as information comes up, as students lie about what they didn't, didn't do. Oh, really? So you just said this, but here on this report it says that. What, what, what's up with that? They'll, add, they'll call them on their, on their stuff. So I so just want to be clear, there are 
an, an infinite number of questions that could be asked. These questions are always asked. Okay, so here is the student. So the questions are there. The student is there by choice. This is the main ingredient at Davidson Middle School. And again, I know schools around here, there are other schools that kids have to go through peer court. There's a whole different mood in those rooms. So I suggest you have your students be there by choice. They answer the questions. The offending student answers questions, listens to other people, and reflects back. So listens to what their brother or sister said, and then reflects back what they said. They read their grades, and they face their community. This is Pedro. That's Pedro and uh, his, his uh, assistant principal. And I'll talk a little bit more about her role, but I will just tell you, she's there as a mentor or a coach for him. So if he doesn't understand the questions or he needs to sit up or speak louder, she helps him out. Our admin loves this job, this peer court thing, because it gives them a chance to be somebody else besides just as disciplinarian. They really get to be uh, uh, a champion for that student. So here's Pedro. We love this picture because he's got a little you know, a little embarrassment going on. That totally works for us. So here's how we sit. You can see it's a very tiny picture, but there's the panel. There's Pedro and his uh, assistant principal. There's me back there, and there's his father and the, the translator for the father in the background. And you can see we're doing this in like a storage room that we have, right? It's not luxurious. Sometimes we do them right in my classroom. So, uh, so like that, any space works. Okay. Okay, and here we are again. And there is Pedro, nervous the whole time. Very good. So we love that. <laughs> it's really great. Because you know what? Here's what happens too, Sarah, is they'll come in the room and they'll have a little attitude sometimes. A lot of times it's boys. They'll be like, oh, I don't care about this. This is lame, da, da, da. And then they walk in and they see kids from their classes or even their friends or kids who are children of their parents' friends, and wow, the whole mood of them changes. They're like, oh, wow. They soften up a lot. They get embarrassed. And the, the hardness just drops away because they're about to have a conversation with their own peers. And that is so unusual and disarming, and it really is a, a, a great thing. So there's that. There's our student. He's in the middle of this fabulous hub of activity. So here we go. Family member or advocates are always present. This is Pedro's father. During the proceedings, he's present listening. Uh, here is another picture. This is uh, Victoria. She's turning to ask him um, a question or to find out some more about what he just said. So the family is present during the proceedings. They're present in the conversations in the hall during deliberations. And again, a lot of great work gets done there. Families really can kind of wake up in those few moments out in the hall. So the family's present. Community is present, so if the te offending teacher is there, maybe the front office staff, somebody's there, if they were the one offended, custodians, neighbors, anybody from the community who has been um, offended is welcome to join us. These are all adults, though. We don't really have uh, kids come in. What's next? Okay, and then there's the coach. That's me or whoever that would be at your school. Um, the coach sets up for the peer court, takes notes during the proceedings, so setting up means choosing the panel, getting the room, inviting the parent. It's actually a, a, a quite a bit of work, so you need to make sure that you have somebody who's available to do all this. Um, like that, they take notes, they occasionally jump in to ask a question. You know, hold on, it seems like you skipped over that part about X. What about that? They facilitate the discussion during the deliberation, so I stay in the room with them during deliberation. Mostly I just stand at the board and write down what they say. And then I monitor and support the offending student's progress towards completion of the program. These kids who are going through suspension diversion mostly have no muscle for arranging tutoring appointments. No muscle. They have no idea how to write an effective apology letter. They have no idea how to you know, get themselves on a football team. So that's my job is to help them so I check in with them a couple times a week to make sure that they're actually progressing in the program. As soon as it seems like they're not doing it or they say they're not doing it, then they get suspended. Okay. So, so that's how that works. We don't waste anybody's time. So here I am in the front of the room writing down. They're making suggestions about what should be on a program, and I'm just writing that stuff down. And I was wondering if before when, you know, when the, the student is, um, the offending student is coming in, um, is there any um, kind of discussion with them about 
is there like a preparation for them or anything to discuss what's going to happen or just like maybe what they need to say or do you kind of let, you know, the process take its course? So it, it really depends on the offending student. They'll always be told what's going to happen. You're going to walk in, there's going to be a panel of your peers in there, they're going to ask you questions about what happened, and their job is to really help you get all this sorted out so that you can repair the harm that you did so you can stay in school and so you can get this thing taken off your record. So that's, some kids just get that basic of an intro. Other kids, I'll bring them in and we'll go over the questions in advance. I don't have them right their answers, but I'll show them the list and I'll ask them, what would you say to this? What would you say to that? So I just familiarize them with the questions. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's sort of on a case-by-case -case basis that we do that. Okay. Okay, so the panel's there, the offending student's there, the offending student's family or advocates are there, the coach is there, and an administrator is there. The administrator offers the diversion and makes the referral to the peer court. They attend the court as the student's coach, and they complete all the official records. So here is Pedro's assistant principal. She looks like she's trying to clarify something for him. So she's just talking to him. She's, she's there on his team and, uh, and there to help him out. So again, administrators right. love this deal because they really get to be with people in a way that makes a difference for them. So all the questions get answered, everything gets done. Now we're going to deliberate and put the program together. So the panel offers the student a contract. Here are some of the things that go on a student contract. And again, like I said before, it's pretty much tailored to the offense and to the offending students. So a student might get tutoring if their grades are low, or they might tutor someone else if their grades are high. They'll participate in restorative circles. They might have to sign up for an after-school program or join a team. They might do community service. They might participate in counseling. They might have to write and do classroom presentations. When we had a bunch of kids smoking hookah pens in class, we had a number of them write and do classroom presentations about the dangers of hookah pens. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the panel themselves, 7th and 8th graders, send 7th and 8th graders to go get drug and alcohol testing or counseling. Right? They're not fooling around. This is really like you've got to get this stuff done. Maybe they might have to plan an hour of family time a week or do daily chores. And we had one kid who was particularly mean to people and one of the panel members. I just think you should learn to say three nice things a day. So they assigned them a schedule of saying three nice things a day. And it actually made a really big difference for him. We had to practice because he didn't even know what that meant. Oh, wow. Like, what do you mean, say three nice things a day? And the girl was like, well, make it easy on yourself. Just say, hey, isn't the weather great today? Or, wow, you did a great job in math class today. Or those are cool shoes. She was like, just make it easy on yourself. So mm -hmm. that's what he did. At the end of that, actually, he, they asked him, did you say three nice things a day? And he said, no, I said more than three nice things a day. <laughs> That's awesome. And then I, I asked him some weeks after the program was over, I said, so are you still saying three nice things a day? And he's like, no, but I will say I don't say that many mean things anymore. So that That's was a good, good breakthrough right there. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I don't think an adult would have assigned them to say three nice things a day, but a, a lovely yeah. girl did. So they, they have this contract. Everybody comes back in the room, and the contract gets read. Here you can see Victoria's turning to ask the dad, will that work? for you? Will it work for you to have him go to drug and alcohol counseling? Will it work for you for him to stay after school and do tutoring? So we always make sure there's workability with the folks. Mm -hmm. Everything gets written down. There we go. And I guess that's right when they asked him, will you complete this program? And he said yes. And, and she shook his hand, which is not part of what we actually do, but that's what happened that day. Okay, so then what happens here is so he's on this contract, all this kind of stuff. So what happens is this sets in motion all sorts of ways for Pedro to actually increase his connection and his relationship with the school community. Suddenly, he's in touch with students who volunteer. They volunteer to tutor. They volunteer to work together on projects or study for tests or help with apology letters. So the kids who are on the peer court but aren't on that panel, they are often volunteering to do these kind of things. So suddenly Pedro has got a team of students who are going to help him. He's connected now with after school activities or sports. So he probably had to stay after school and do some tutoring. We've had kids join football teams and join book clubs and not, you know, if a kid didn't like to read, they don't have to join a book club, right? So it's really like, what do you like to do? Oh, I like art. How about taking an art class? Great, I'll do it. 
right? So we really want it to be something that makes the student, that develops their natural interests. If a student is already on a baseball team, we don't take them off, right? So that's why they ask them, what are your responsibilities after school? What do you do after school? Because if they're on a team, we want them to stay on that team. So we want to build the program around the student's availability. If they're doing good things, we want to encourage them to continue to do that. We have counseling and community programs. Kids have gone for counseling for sexual harassment, for drug and alcohol use, for uh, making good decisions, peer pressure, anger management, all kinds of stuff. Counseling and community programs are suddenly in motion for that student. And teachers and adult volunteers also volunteer to tutor, read work, and help presentations. We have a, a teacher here on campus who just volunteers. To, she doesn't volunteer, I'm sorry. She's paid to do all of the uh, tutoring for the suspension diversion program. So that's what she does, and that's a great asset. OK, so here we go. So here's the student in the middle. And now all of these opportunities for connection are built in to the peer court contract. Great. That's great. So it is. It's great. So here's another review of the contract. So now the student's working on the contract. The coach monitors and supports the student's progress toward the completion of the program. The student panel, at the end of the two weeks, looks over all the student's documents, asks some clarifying questions. For example, like, why did you miss tutoring last Tuesday? How are you going to make that up? They discuss any concerns they have with the student. And then the student panel recommends diversion a suspension or an extension of that program. So if there's a couple things they didn't do or they've got maybe two tutoring sessions to make up, they might grant an extension if the student um, requests it. So that's what the student panel okay. does. After the two-week program, they recommend what's going to happen. Oh, I guess I thought they were so cute I put them on there. Oh, no, <laughs> this is what it was. You don't have to call. I didn't call the whole panel back. So, you, so I just had these three students read over the documents and do like that. So it's not that we have to call back the whole panel, the same panel. Just call back uh, three or so of the students from the original panel. And I always like to choose the ones that I think will be the most scrutinizing. And then we'll be willing to say, those are lame apology letters. So you want to choose the, those kids for that. Then there's they, that, that smaller panel makes a recommendation to the administrator about uh, whether the student would be suspended, um, extended or diverted. Okay. And the administrator completes all the records. And then there's follow-up and completion. There we go. Those are the three options. And here's a fabulous chart about the difference we made at Davidson Middle School with our suspension diversion program and a couple of other programs that we do. And just want to show you, especially on the right-hand side, uh, we at the, at the time of this, we were one of the highest API scores in Marin County. As our suspensions went down, our API went up consistently, and the steepest increases were for Latino low income and our ELL students. So that I can show because I'm so proud of it. And I think that is the that? whole deal. Awesome. Um, so I have just a few questions for you that I didn't weave into everything. Um, okay. Just a few that were still left over. Um, a few people and during the first um, presentation that we did wanted to know more about some of the other restorative um, uh, features that you are using at Davidson. OK. Um, well, I personally use community building circles in my classroom. We also have a restorative practices program where students can self-report conflicts that they have or conflicts that their friends have. And we use restorative circles for those. Uh, for bullying intervention, we use a protocol called Solution Team, which you can look on the web. Very effective for bullying intervention. It's not a cultural change program, but it's really great for disappearing specific incidents of, of bullying. And that's what we use. OK, great. And then um, someone had a question along restorative um, um, lines about whether um, if there's ever a point um, and this might just be an easy, logical question, but like if there's ever a point where you use, instead of suspension diversion, you use a harm or conflict circle. Um, and so would you be using harm or conflict circles when something is not rising to a suspension, but there are oh, yeah. some That's right. conflicts? 
that's part of the reason why our suspensions are down is because we are de-escalating conflicts before they become problems. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah, so that's what we do. Also, I just realized I didn't follow up on something, so I just want to say about Pedro. Um, as a result of his uh, suspension diversion program, he completed a drug and alcohol problem, uh, drug and alcohol program. Oh, he great. He didn't miss a single mo other day of school. He was a chronic uh, truant. He didn't miss any more school. I think it was like for... I think it was six weeks till the end of school, so he missed no more school. His attendance was perfect after that. That's and great. also, he had failing grades. He was in danger of being retained. And because of the tutoring and all of that stuff, uh, he has brought his grades up enough that he was actually able to graduate from Davidson Middle School. Oh, that's so he great. He produced great results for himself. Yeah. Yeah, so and also fantastic. really seems like that, you know, suspension diversion also is just a really great way of identifying students who are having some more impact issues that need a lot more scaffolding and support. So yeah, it sounds really absolutely. great. Um, and then I think um, the one last question um, was whether you are paid for your, because you are a teacher at the school, but um, there's a question about whether you were paid for your time to run the peer court suspension diversion program. I am. Okay, great. Um, and you were saying that you are available to give some other trainings to people if they contact you, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and, I, and I just I want to be really clear. I know some people will just go ahead and do try to figure this all out, but I've really just given you like the bare minimum of this. There's a lot more to it, a lot more nuance, and a lot more stuff to it. So if anybody wants to contact me just for you know conversation on the phone or anything like that or any additional training, I'm glad to to uh, to entertain all. That's great. And then just for this recording, even though I showed it earlier, um, Karen's email is showed earlier in this recording, but her email address is kjunker at srcs.org. So just it's up there. If you need to look at it, it's in the first within the first few minutes of this presentation. Um, but also you can get it just there. Um, and I think that that's about it. Um, Great. I guess just one more thing I want to say is I'm also a trained trainer for the International Institute for Restorative Practices. So if you have any questions about restorative practices in general or how to use restorative circles for conflict resolution or anything like that, I'm glad, I'd be glad to talk with anybody who wants to talk about that. Too. Yes, yes. And that is really great. Um, we are actually in the process of putting together um, the updates for the third um, toolkit. And so Karen's information um, and that she's a trainer for IIRP, IIRP um, and um, also, you know, working at Davidson on Pure Courts will be in there. So if you want to contact her um, about what's going on and kind of get some help for your school, you can definitely do that. Um, by looking in the toolkit, which is, you know, downloadable from our website, or you can email me, Sarah, to get it. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for hosting this and for uh, making this available for this fabulous tool for available for so many people. I hope it really oh, makes a difference. Great. Thank, and thank you so much for um, bearing with me twice to do it. You You're are welcome. welcome. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>